you're watching Foreign Correspondents. I'm Min Sun Hee with our group of foreign journalists. Welcome to the show. Nice to be there. Now, tensions between Seoul and Tokyo have been escalating amid the installation of a statue outside the Japanese consulate in the southern port city of Busan. Last month, the statue commemorates the Korean women who were forced into sexual slavery for Japanese soldiers during World War II. Activists here explain the statue is a peaceful symbol to encourage accurate historical awareness. Japan in response has recalled its top. Envoy to Korea. We have details on this diplomatic dispute in this report. Korea and Japan have started the new year off with icy relations. Nagamine, Sukan, Kok Taish, Oyobi, Morimoto Zai, Kuzan, Soryo, Jino, Ichiji Kiko. On January 6, the Japanese government announced it would temporarily recall its ambassador to Korea. The move was in protest against the installation of a statue symbolizing Korean sex slaves under Imperial Japan in front of the Japanese consulate in the southern city of Busan. On December 28, in time for the first anniversary of an agreement between Korea and Japan on the issue of sexual slavery, a civic group first attempted the installation. It was removed once, but due to strong protests from the public, the statue was eventually placed in front of the consulate on December 30th. The Japanese government immediately lodged a complaint against Korea. Tokyo said that the installation violates the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, which stipulates that a host country must protect the dignity of the consulate. It also called on Seoul to uphold the bilateral agreement on sexual slavery. The reaction from the Japanese media was somewhat mixed. Yomiuri Shimbun in an editorial said that erecting the Pusan statue is illegal and in violation of the bilateral deal. On the other hand, an editorial from Asai Shimbun argued that an excessive response will only set off a vicious cycle in relations and that the Japanese government should review more appropriate measures. In response to Tokyo's decision, Seoul's foreign ministry summoned the Japanese ambassador for talks, but this is merely seen as an expression of disapproval toward the Japanese government. As tensions rise between Seoul and Tokyo over the so-called Comfort Woman statue, we sit down now to discuss what repercussions this will have. Here in Korea, a frequent headline this week has been the diplomatic row between Seoul and um, Tokyo over the installation of the statue outside the Japanese consulate in Busan. How do you view Japan's decision to recall its ambassador to Korea? From the Japanese point of view, an agreement was signed and Japan was expecting these statues to be removed and now a new statue is appearing in front of their consulate. So, but there is nothing much they can do. Uh, really, I think one of the very few diplomatic way you can resort, you can use to, to show your displeasure. But I don't think it will change much. The ambassador will be back. It's just a symbolic measure. You know, I think that uh, the ambassador will be gone for, for something like a week. It's, it's viewed as a less serious uh, issue than Im Myung-bak's visit to, to Dokdo uh, earlier, where the ambassador was gone for, for what's considered to be or will be likely a, a longer period of time. And I think we need to also look at, at Japan's uh, treatment of the comfort women issue and, and Abe's own treatment of the comfort women issue as well and the level of remorse and apology that's been stated or not stated uh, by Japan when we take a look at this issue and also the, f the freedom of speech that, that should be respected for, for municipalities. If they want to put up a statue uh, in their municipality uh, in front of whatever embassy, I think it's hard for the central government to say that we made an agreement that we're going to curtail, curtail your freedom of speech because of some article in the UN Convention a, a, about embassies, about impinging on the dignity of the embassy. You know, I weigh that with, you know, let's say that's some type of an abuse of the, the Japanese embassy. I weigh that abuse with the um, sexual enslavement of 200,000 women and it doesn't really um, balance out.
Right. Now, aside from recalling its uh, top envoy, Japan has also suspended uh, talks on resuming bilateral currency swap arrangements. It's uh, also postponed high-level economic uh, talks, as well as called on its officials in the consulate in Busan to put on hold all participation in scheduled events in uh, Busan. How do you view these strong retaliation measures? It is a strong retaliation and it, you have to remember also, I think, that this comes after a period of, um, of Japan and South Korea coming closer together. So this agreement was seen as a big improvement when it was made, the agreement on, on comfort women uh, a little more than a year ago. And um, the exchange of intelligence that, that was made late last year between uh, Japan and South Korea was also seen as a pretty big improvement in terms of the bilateral relationship uh, between the two countries. So they have come closer together. However, if, as we look into the future, it might be, might be difficult for them to, um, to, to come back to the, the place that they were uh, a year ago, I think, uh, when we see what's happening in, in the U.S. and uh, with an upcoming election here in South Korea. Um, but that remains to be seen, of course. The problem is, at the time, the government, the South Korean government made a mistake. I mean, they should not have signed this agreement about comfort women without consulting the comfort women first. And I think there was a huge mistake they did. They, I don't know why they rush to sign with Shindo Abe without consulting first all these, the victims themselves. Yes, I agree with that. I think it was a problematic agreement, just like the security information exchange, the intelligence information exchange with Japan. There's a lot of resistance toward both of these agreements here in South Korea. And the, the South Korean government, Bak and he didn't do a good enough job in, in consulting the stakeholders before making this agreement um, with Japan. Right. Frank, you mentioned this earlier. There is a statue outside the Japanese embassy in uh, Seoul, and Tokyo has claimed that it violates Article 22 of the 1961 Vienna Convention, which states that uh, host countries must protect the premises of diplomatic missions and from any disturbance of the peace of the mission or impairment of its dignity. Do you believe the statue violates this article, Marcus? That's a tricky question. I mean, I, uh, I think on the one hand, of course, it's very important for the host country to protect the embassies and uh, to make sure that the, the staff there can go, come and go uh, and, and, and be, be safe. Um, on the other hand, I think um, that when you have an embassy in a democratic country like South Korea, you have to expect that you might see public expressions of discontent of, of some sort or the other. You might see demonstrations. Um, I mean, in my, in my home country of, of Denmark, you often have demonstrations in front of the U.S. embassy, for example, um, and other embassies. Um, I think this is something you see all around the world and, and it's something that, that Japan should be prepared for uh, as well. Right. Appearing on a TV program, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe claimed Korea should show its sincerity to the 2015 agreement reached between the two governments over the comfort women issue. We have details in this report. Every Wednesday at noon, a protest takes place in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul. It's now been 25 years since this demonstration first began. The event known as the Wednesday demonstration demands redress from Japan on the issue of sexual slavery. <laughs> The euphemism comfort women refers to women who were forced into sexual slavery before and during World War II by the Japanese military. The girl statue symbolizing these women was first erected on December 14th in 2011 to commemorate the victims during the 1000th Wednesday demonstration in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul. In 2013, the girl statue was unveiled in Glendale, California, becoming the first such installation overseas. But in February 2014, a Japanese right-wing group filed a lawsuit with a federal court to have the statue removed. It was finally dismissed in August 2016 after the opponents lost their appeal as well. In terms of the most recent Pusan statue, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has directly expressed his strong discontent towards the issue. 
On January 8th, during a show on national broadcaster NHK, Abe brought up the sexual slavery agreement and said Japan has faithfully carried out its responsibility by donating 1 billion yen and that Korea needs to show its sincerity. The agreement Abe was referring to is the deal concluded by Korea and Japan on December 28, 2015. One month before the agreement, a Japanese media outlet reported that Abe had demanded the statue be removed, but the Korean government refuted this report. Seoul has so far refused to engage in the statue installation issue, saying it's carried out by private groups. But Tokyo has continually demanded the Korean government remove these monuments. Frank, there is a comfort woman statue in Toronto. I believe it was installed there in late 2015. What are your thoughts on this? Well, you know, this, this statue actually was going to be in, in a place called Burnaby, which is right in sort of near my hometown. I'm from New Westminster. It's a suburb of Vancouver on the west coast. The idea was, came from the mayor of Hwasong here in South Korea, and I think Burnaby is a sister city or something to Hwasong. What happened was, after the initial idea to put this statue in Central Park in, in Burnaby, there was a backlash from the Japanese-Canadian community that objected to this statue being there. And then a secondary location was found at 1133 Leslie Street. That's the location of the uh, Korean Canadian Community Center of Toronto. And that's where the statue now sits. Uh, this is an issue certainly for, for Canadians and it's also, I think we need to, to sort of take this out of a historical con context as well. I, I read a review about uh, a documentary that was made by a, a young Canadian woman, her name's Tiffany Tsiong, she made a documentary called The Apology. It's about the comfort women issue. She traveled to here, she interviewed many comfort women. It features three uh, comfort women uh, in particular. And a review of that that, that I read in a, in a Canadian media said, woman gets raped, woman reports rape, woman gets called names. And this is depicted in the film. And, and I think, again, if, if to, to, to bring this into a contemporary sort of spotlight, if we can't hold institutionalized rape to account, how can we expect to solve the problem of sex trafficking and rape in our societies today? And I think that's one of the reasons that people are so angry about this issue here in South Korea. Uh, Abe really has sidestepped a, a, a genuine apology. He gave it through surrogates. He gave it on the telephone to Bach and Hay. He didn't say, express personally his remorse or an apology. And I think that even happened when he went to Pearl Harbor. It was more like, it's too bad that happened, rather than accepting uh, your own responsibility and apologizing. And I think that's the perspective that that people have here in South Korea. And that's behind uh, these continuing historical problems between the two countries. The campaign to install statues extend beyond national boundaries. We talked about one in Toronto, there are two in the US and one in uh, uh, Australia. Uh, do you, to a certain extent, understand Japan's reservations regarding the presence of these statues worldwide? I think that's, that's really part of the problem. The conservative element, neo-nationalism in Japan is, is kind of accepted. Whereas, you know, if we, if we make this analogy now, I'm not equating the Holocaust with the uh, sexual enslavement of uh, the Japanese military. So, you know, that's really, I think, the issue that, that Koreans have is that history was treated so much differently. The, the, the war was treated so much differently here that, you know, getting over that historical, you know, baggage is going to be much, much more difficult. I'm, I'm a bit concerned too by the, the attempts by the Shinzo Abe administration to rewrite history. Uh, when I visited the Yasukuni Shrine, I visited the museum, the Yushukan, just next to it. And it's very striking to see how it's just a museum about the the glory and the force, the power of the, of the military government at the time and the military force of, uh, of Japan. There is nothing much like the, all the, the, col the colonization of Korea, the, 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 the military expansion 
is always justified. It's never shown as something bad. It's, it's shown as inevitable. It's really a museum to the showing the, the like the glory of the hero, the Japanese hero who fought the war, and I, I mean I, I find that very problematic. Right. I agree, and, and I think you have to remember that this is not only about the past. I mean, you, you can see that how a country um, perceives its nationalist past also um, shows uh, how it might uh, react in the future. I mean, it's, um, the past is often used uh, by nationalists to, to, um, to create an even more nationalist environment in, in, the, in the future. If you can blame uh, conflicts that the country has been in in the past on other countries, that makes it more difficult for your own country to establish uh, peaceful, um, meaningful relationships with your neighbors uh, in the future. Right. It's probably this, uh, in a, this difference at looking at the past between Korea and Japan that makes it so difficult for them perhaps to bridge their differences. Uh, a recent survey of citizens um, in the two countries actually showed 75% of Koreans claiming that there should be more talks on the uh, comfort women issue, while the similar number, 74% of Japanese, claimed that the talks should come to an end now. How do you view this? <laughs> well, I think that, you know, both of those are encouraging. I don't think that's bad. 25% of, of Japanese people think that these talks should, should carry on, and 25% of South Koreans think there's been, a, been enough done. So I think that, that looking at the, it from that perspective, I think that's a little bit encouraging. Uh, and I would hope that maybe we'll find some middle ground and, and perhaps a new government will be able to come up with a, a different or modified a, agreement with Japan on the issue. Frank, I like the optimism there. Right? <laughs> I'm less optimistic, I would yeah. say. I mean, the, the way I see it now on both sides uh, of the East Sea, uh, we see in Korea politicians using um, the, the comfort women issue as a way to raise. It's, it's, very, it's very easy. You, use, you, use, you raise comfort women issue and you use, you use it to raise your popularity. So there is really no effort on the Korean side to try to find an agreement, find a compromise. And same, it's exactly the same in Japan where they use the past and the history. They completely politicize it. They completely try to rewrite it. To, I mean, in South Korea, they don't try to rewrite it, but they, 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 there is the same political way. To, to use history to boost your popularity and to, to, to get elected at the next, uh, next election. Right. Many here in Korea highlight Germany's efforts to address its wartime atrocities as an example of sincere apology and regret. Let's take a look at this video. Germany and Japan both committed war crimes during World War II. But the two countries appear to have differing views toward their past. Germany carried out the Holocaust, killing some six million Jews during the war. Since the end of the war, it has acknowledged its responsibility for such atrocious acts and apologized for its past. German Chancellor Angela Merkel, after taking office, has apologized for the brutality of Nazi Germany when provided with the opportunity. Als Mitläufer, als Wegschauende, Und stillschweigende Mitwisser. During her visit to Japan in March 2015, Merkel indirectly criticized Japan's attitude towards its past wrongdoings while apologizing for Germany's past. The National Socialism, the Holocaust for Deutschland, is a shrinkly schuld, die we auf uns geladen haben. And in so weit. In contrast, in October last year, when asked whether he would send a letter of apology to sex slave victims, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said there is no such possibility, in effect denying a direct apology to the victims. Two months later, Abe's cabinet members sparked controversy by paying their respects at Yasukuni Shrine, which honors Japan's war dead, including war criminals. <laughs> While Germany acknowledges its wrongdoings and persecution of others, Japan is seen as lacking remorse, which is why perceptions held by the international community of the two countries also differ. It's been well over seven decades after the Second World War and Germany still seems hesitant about displaying a patriotism amid fears that such displays may bring to mind uh, pains of the past. Do you believe 
Frank, that this is the general attitude of the German people? Germany expressed its remorse and apology on an incredibly grand scale, and they continue to do so. And there are monuments you know, regarding the Holocaust and the horrors of the Second World War in Germany that every German you know, young person has visited during their school uh, time and, and also politicians in Germany visit during this, their, their you know, uh, tenures in office on, on national holidays commemorating um, the war. In Japan, we haven't seen that kind of remorse. They gloss over their militarism uh, of the Second World War. They, they have the Yasukuni Shrine exists itself and has 14 Class A war criminals interned in it that is frequently visited by a high-level Japanese official, including the Minister of Defense, the day after Abe's you know, visit with Obama at Pearl Harbor. So I think Germany is an example that can be followed, hopefully by Japan, in terms of accepting remorse and apology for what has happened in the past, but still having a, a healthy um, perspective on your country's position in the present. One reason that the Germany has been um, has been able to move on is not only, I think, because of, of their uh, very emotional uh, apologies. It's also, I think, in part due to the EU. The, the European Union has uh, uh, made the countries, the European countries, come very closely together. And if you look at opinion polls of, um, from Europeans where they talk about their relationship with their neighbors, you would see that most Europeans are quite uh, happy with their, with their neighboring countries. Uh, so if you ask uh, f f the French or, or the Dutch what they feel about their German neighbors, uh, a big majority would say that they're very happy with, with Germans. Whereas if, if you ask uh, Koreans or Japanese or Chinese how they feel about their neighbors, uh, the numbers are very different. I, I agree with you and I would add one thing is that EU was possible because, like building EU was possible because of this uh, attitude from Germany. I don't think France would have agreed to, to build such a close union with Germany if Germans didn't show this repentance and remorseful attitude. So it goes, uh, sure, yeah. goes together. Yeah, it goes both ways. And also he here in, in East Asia, that historical baggage that, that hasn't been dealt with in the past is holding up uh, institutions, institutional developments and, and regional trade here in, in the East Asian region as well. And that's something that, that's recognized a lot by political scientists. They say, why can't we have an EU uh, here in Asia like they have you know, in, in Europe that everybody benefits from, from trade and it's, it's really great and they have good feelings about each other's countries and you know, masses of, of tourism and, and this type of, of thing. And you don't have that here in Asia, and I think that you know the reason is is that they haven't dealt with this historical baggage in the same way that they have in Europe. And it's some, uh, that's something that's sometimes referred to as the Asian paradox. I think right that uh, that countries are are able to trade so uh, so closely linked by trade, but that there's still a uh, a lot of people that don't like the the people from the other country. There's a lot of uh, resentment going on there. Yeah. There's a there's reservations, but yeah. trade and cultural exchange. Is, That's is quite right. strong. Right, but there exactly. are reservations uh, among the people. Yeah. Right. Um, what do you suppose then is the reason behind this discrepancy in attitude regarding history between Japan and Germany? Is it the education? Is it culture? I think there is one very simple reason. It's right after the war, German people and Japanese people received a very different message. In Germany, all the ministers under Hitler got jailed, some of them got executed, and nobody went back to assume position of power. While in Japan, uh, after the war, um, the US decided to fight against communism and they decided that some of the former minister, like Shinzo Abe grandfather, who was minister of munition of uh, the Amiral Tojo, were taken out of their jail and put back in position of power. They were not punished. Uh, the, the Shinzo Abe grandfather became prime minister for three years. So I think the, I mean, U.S. played a part in that, and Japanese people receive a very, very different message than German people at the end of the war. What role do you suppose then can we, those in the media, play to ensure a proper historical awareness in the future? Is there a role that we can play? Well, we can, we can, we can certainly, we can, we can try to try to explain the history between countries, a very complicated, very long uh, history between a country like Japan and, and South Korea, and we have to 
uh, study that uh, to some extent when we report on issues like the comfort women. And I think coming here on the show today and, and talking about this issue is, is one such step we can make. I'm encouraged by some of the media that I read, for instance, the Japan Times. They also take ex exception to the term comfort women and, and suggest that the term sex slaves is, yeah. is more appropriate. And I found that, that to be to be quite encouraging. Um, perhaps it would be better if we were having this show uh, on uh, uh, NHK English or, <laughs> or a Japanese network. Right. Uh, if you ask any Korean what day August 15th is, he or she will quickly respond National Liberation Day. If you ask the same person what day August 14th is, he or she may not respond as quickly. August 14th is the International Memorial Day for Comfort Women, a day that commemorates the women who were all forced to serve Japanese soldiers during the Second World War. Thank you for watching.